In the last video, we showed you a lot of the fun action shots of getting the frames bent in. Hey, down she goes. And since this boat is designed around its steam bent frames, we wanted to go into a bit more in depth about bending them and how we picked the framing stock and all that fun stuff. Since framing out the boat is, is really a, a very big critical step in the build and getting her first frames in is a really big milestone for us. So let's take a closer look at what that entailed. So I guess the first place to start with framing would be the framing stock. Uh, and this is the framing stock that we milled up but we haven't got to quite yet. So this is all white oak and it came from the trees that we harvested on the property. So we went out to our oak pile and started digging through it. And since the bent frames aren't very big in dimension, we need to make sure that they're clear of any defects and that the grain runs straight in the board and we don't have any or very little grain run out in the, um, in the frames. So we would dig through the pile and we would find boards that were good candidates. And we, then we would take the chalk line and snap a straight edge just inside the sap line following the angle of the grain. And then we would rip them into six, nine, 12 inch wide boards. And that would let us get two, four, five frames out of them. Uh, and that was just to get these giant big beams down to something that was manageable. We'll get two full lengths here. And then we'll get a short one underneath and that'll just end up being scrap. Once we had those smaller beams, we brought them into the boathouse and started running them through the thickness planer. Um, but even with the brand new spiral cutter heads, the thickness planer kind of struggled with some of those thicker ones. So once we got them cleaned up a little bit, we put them onto the bandsaw and ripped them down to about two and seven eighths or so by two and seven eighths. Once we got them knocked down into the smaller sticks, we could run them through the joiner and through the thickness planer, and they're much easier to handle, and the joiner and thickness planer just ate those smaller frames right up. And once we got them down to their final finished dimensions of two and a half by two and a half, we figured out which way the grain was running on the end, and then ran them through the bandsaw and just split them down the middle. While we're on the subject of framing, one of the things we want to take a little bit of time to talk about and explain was the difference between sawn or grown frames and bent frames. And the terms sawn frame and grown frame are just different terms for the same type of frame. So in classic wooden boat construction, generally boats are either built with sawn frames or bent frames, and sometimes a combination of the two. And there's no right or wrong, there's just a lot of differences between them in the way the boat is designed and the way the boat is constructed. Since Alex and I are by no means professional or experienced boat builders, uh, we have a few guiding lights that we use for the project. And one of those is Bud McIntosh's How to Build a Wooden Boat. And it's a great, great reference for the general construction of a wooden boat like ours. When it comes to the more nitty gritty details, like the exact size of the timbers and how big your fasteners need to be and how many fasteners you need, Bud doesn't really go into that level of detail, so for that we've been turning to this guy Dave Gurr who wrote uh, The Elements of Boat Strength. And Dave goes into a lot of detail about exactly how many fasteners and what size and their components. Um, and he talks about the differences between bent frames and sawn or grown frames. So in talking about the differences of grown frames versus bent frames, Dave Gurr says, Steam bent frames are generally superior for round bilge hulls. This is because the grain in the frame runs smoothly and evenly in the direction of the frame throughout its length. Laminated frames are nearly as strong and resilient as steam bent frames, but they require more labor. 
By contrast, the grain and sawn frames almost always run at off angles to the direction of the frame itself. As a consequence, sawn frames in round bilge hulls are only about half as strong as steam bent or laminated frames. And he goes on to say that some people worry about rot occurring between the two layers of a steam bent frame. However, this does not seem to be a problem. I've inspected several vessels that are more than 50 feet long that were built with split bent frames. These boats are all more than 30 years old, and although they had rot in several locations, the one place there wasn't any was between the split frames. So we split our frames to help facilitate that bending, and from everything we've ever read, it doesn't really create a rot issue. So let's look at some actual lumber choices here and one of our bent frames and we can show you exactly what this guy Dave's talking about. So here we have some lumber that we picked out of the pile that would be pretty decent examples of the lumber that you would look for if you were going to build a boat with bent frames or with sawn frames. Um, this lumber isn't totally ideal. Uh, there's some knots, there's some defects, that kind of thing. So ignore that. Um, but what we're really look, looking for and focusing on is the grain orientation and how these two different trees grew. This board is a great example of what you'd be looking for in stock for bent frames. Uh, if you look, you can see that the bark is almost perfectly straight and the line between the sapwood and the heartwood of the tree is almost perfectly straight. There's a lot of knots and defects in this lower half, but this upper part here is perfectly clear. And that's exactly what you want, is very straight grain, very clear grain. And what you end up doing is ripping out a strip of this, following the grain as closely as you can. And you would end up with a frame that was square or rectangular, depending on you know, how big the scantlings of your boat were and what you were building. But you end up with these long, straight strips of stock that you cut out, and you cut them out following that grain as best you can, and avoiding the sapwood and avoiding the uh, pith in the center of the tree or any of the knots and defects. And then you take this straight timber that you end up with, and you put it in your steam box, and you bend it to your molds and your rib bands, and that straight timber becomes a bent frame like this. And the white oak, the Quercus alba that we have here in New England is absolutely brilliant bending wood. Um, some species of wood steam and bend really well, others do it horribly, and a lot of them fall on that spectrum somewhere in the middle. But this white oak that we have, it will grow if it's grown in the forest in nice straight long lengths like this, and it bends beautifully, and it stays in that shape once it cools. So you can take that, that straight stock with that grain that runs all the way down it and bend it, and then that means that this grain perfectly follows this curve the whole way and there's no grain run out. And grain run out is a very weak thing in a timber and that's where it's most likely to break. So when you're doing the bent frames, you want to start with that really straight grain wood. If you're going to do sawn frames or grown frames, you want the exact opposite. We finished milling all the frame stock, so it's all down to two and a half by two and a half, which is the finished dimension. And then we set up the magna jigs here and put in the thinnest, sharpest bandsaw blade we have. And I've been working on splitting them. So with the jigs, we we'll just put the frame in, slide it right down. We're splitting it to within five inches of the end and slide it back out. And that way the frame will stay together when it goes in the steam box and we take it out. And this split, it'll help us when we bend it. So. If you think about when you bend it, the outside tries to extend and the inside tries to compress. And this way we'll have a little bit of a slip surface in the middle. So once the frames are all bent in, if you go and you look at the tops of them, the outer one will seem shorter than the inner one, because the outer one will actually end up covering a little bit bigger distance than that inner half will. Um, and then once the planking goes on, these will all get through bolted together and should be good for a very long time. So before we piled them in the steam box, we wanted to make sure that there wasn't any sawdust stuck in the kerf, because then that was going to mix with the steam and just kind of make a gunk and a good rot spot that would never leave. 
So the last step for the frames and the crew before the steam box was to give them a quick sand. So we had all of our framing crew jump out there with the air compressor and a sander and some uh, chunks of sandpaper and just go through the frames and give them a really light sand and a quick blast with the air compressor. And all we were trying to do is round out the corners a little bit and smooth things out. It would one, lessen the chance of us getting splinters when you're handling them and bending them in. And two, if the frames did want to split or crack, having a really sharp corner is more likely to break and start that split. So just by rounding them out ever so slightly, we could mitigate a little bit of that. So yeah, once they got a quick blast with the air compressor and a light sand, they went into the steam box. One of the hallmarks of this project is us figuring things out and sometimes things don't go as planned. And this tank is the perfect example of that. So we bought it with the idea of using it as our melting tank for the lead and it was not up to snuff. So we ended up recycling it into our steam generator, uh, which worked out beautifully. So this is our big leaky steam box. So for a steam box, you want it to be really nice and thick so that it holds that heat, kind of insulates it. You want the interior of the box to be as hot as you can get it. And you also want the steam box to be pretty leaky. Uh, ideally, steam's kind of pouring all out of every nook and cranny of the box, and that way you're sure that you have hot steam traveling all around the box. So, big and thick and insulated, but leaky at the same time. And then we have the lid. We have the part of the tank here, and this holds, I don't know, 50, 60 gallons worth of water. And then another part of the tank became the firebox in the bottom. So we build a big old rip-roaring fire in here. This big old vat of water boils and there's a hole that registers in from the box to the lid here. The steam pours up into the box and the tank's big enough that we can run it for six or eight hours without adding any extra water to it, just having a full roll boil the whole time, which is great. It's worked out really, really well. So once the frames go in the steam box, the general rule of thumb is one hour of steaming per inch of thickness of the wood. Um, so our frames went in for about an hour and 20 minutes. So we had uh, Ryan and Joe keep a schedule to make sure that we knew when the frames went in and when to take the frames out. After an hour and 20 minutes, the first frame came out and we tried to steam that in. Okay. Okay. It's like some ninja shit, okay? It's you too, can you beat it in? Yep. It's not all the way to the ground. It's gotta go down more. Just a little bit more, but you're really close. There you get that sledgehammer down there. It's right by the toolbox. Alright. Okay, we're gonna go with that. I think they're gonna need to steam longer. You steam it longer? Yeah, all right, pop it out. We're gonna have to steam it longer. But they should, um, they should bend easily. Yeah. Like reading Bud McIntosh's book, it should be. If it's not easy, you're doing something wrong. As you saw, the first frame didn't bend at all, which was a little nerve-wracking in front of a big group of people. But the cool thing is, is that all we needed to do is put it right back in. Basically what happens when the wood is steaming is there's this a compound in the wood called lignum, which is basically a glue that keeps the fibers of the wood together. So what you're doing is softening up that lignum and that allows the whole piece of wood to bend. So once we were ready, we added another 20 minutes and the next frame came out. What you do is you put them down into the frame sockets. And now here we had one more issue that we needed to figure out and that's how to keep the bottom of the frame socket from kicking out when it starts to bend in. So we had Ross and Wes and Bob um, figure out how to set up a system over here where we would have a piece of wood that would basically sit up against the bottom of the frame and then we ratcheted that down so it would keep Ratchet that bottom of the frame into the socket. All we needed to make sure was that the frame was all the way down into the bottom so Steve would give that a couple of whacks down 
and now it was crucial. We needed to move as fast as possible. Basically, once it's cooled, it's not bending. So once everything was in place, we got a couple pieces of webbing in through the rib bands. <laughs> and everybody started pulling on those. And since the frame was loosened, it basically takes the shape of all the outside of these rib bands. And that's how you get your steam bed frame. You're timing it? Yep. There you go. Yeah. Alright? Yeah. Alright, in she goes. That's, uh, That's okay, it's just a red bit. Yeah. It doesn't matter what side of steam. <laughs> Steamed <laughs> permanently. <laughs> <laughs> so it can take a lot of force bending those frames into place and there was one tool that was very helpful in that process. So this is what Bud McIntosh calls a stone crusher. And its, main is a, its name is a misnomer because it has nothing to do with stones. <laughs> but basically you can hook a frame into here and it gives you some leverage to bend and it gives you some leverage to twist. Uh, so we tasked one of our volunteers, Ross, with making a stone crusher. And he made the first one with a chunk of hemlock and a piece of steel. And the first frame I hooked it on, I just snapped the hemlock. And I gave the broken tool back to Ross and said, here, Ross, try again. So he went and got this big chunk of oak and bolted the angle iron on there. And I grabbed it and I put it on another frame and I bent the steel anger iron. And I gave it back to Ross and said, Ross, handle's good, the iron's not, try again. So then Joe helped him and they found a leaf spring in the scrap steel bucket and heated it with a torch and ended up bending it for the angle iron. So once we had a really good piece of leaf spring steel on there and a heavy oak handle, it was a great, great tool for uh, bending the frames a bit and also putting some of the twist into the frames as we finished out. So we didn't have it for all the frames, but the ones we did, it made a great difference. So. Thank you, Ross, for your many attempts. The third time was the charm. <laughs> well done. So when you're building a boat with uh, sawn frames or grown frames, you start with the lofting and you make a pattern for what each of your frame is going to be. Um, so if your frame you know, ultimately is going to look like this, you make a pattern that is that entire shape and then that big frame ends up getting made of multiple futtixes because the chances of you getting a tree that grew in this exact curve is pretty much slim to none. Uh, you can find that for some of the straighter runs on the stem and the stern of boats, but very rarely a midship, especially on a round bilge tall. So what you end up doing is making smaller patterns of these and these end up becoming, they're called futtics. So this would be down at the base of this frame. And you want your futtocks to be as long runs as you can, um, but you also need to make sure that the grain follows that. So your size and shape of your futtocks is directly related to the size and the shape of the timbers that you have to work with. The bigger and wilder the timbers, the longer pieces of futtocks that you can make. And they end up being what's called double sawn. So you would put one futtocks next to another, they would extend past and you would end up making a big beam out of them. Just like if you were going to make a laminated structural timber uh, and you just overlap those joints on solid pieces and then they all get fastened together whatever way you choose. So for a grown frame or a sawn frame, you end up making all these FUDX patterns and then you take these around to your lumber pile and you try to find grain that matches them as best you can. So this beam here would be a, a fairly good candidate if you were making uh, sawn or grown frames because it has that kind of 
curvy, crazy grain, and you can find those sweeps. Uh, it, it would be horrible timber to try to mill a bent frame out of because you wouldn't be able to follow that grain in a straight line. So if you can imagine taking the straight edge on here and trying to rip out a straight, narrow piece of timber and following the grain, that wouldn't happen. So you, out of this beam, you wouldn't be able to, to mill out a bunch of straight bending stock. But if you were going to do sawn frames, you can take your futtocks pattern and you can use these curves to your advantage and you can play around and you try to get that futtox to follow that sweep of the grain as best you can so that you have as little grain run out as possible. So because when you do bent frames, that grain runs all the way along that frame and follows it almost perfectly, you can get away with a lot smaller, a lot thinner, a lot lighter framing material than you can when you're doing sawn or grown frames. And that's part of the reason that if you look at a boat with sawn frames, they're just so much bigger. And they have to be because you inevitably have grain run out and whenever you have multiple pieces that are bolted or fastened together to make a piece, they're just not as strong as one continuous piece of material. So when Gurr says that bent frames are basically twice as strong as a sawn frame, what he's referring to is that if you had a sawn frame that was exactly the same size as this bent frame, the bent frame would likely be twice as strong as the sawn frame because the sawn frame has multiple pieces and has grain run out. So to compensate for that, sawn frames are generally twice, maybe even three times as big as a bent frame. And by making them that much bigger, they become about the same level of strength. So if you were to take this pattern off of our bent frames here, it would actually be double this in thickness. So our frames are two and a half by two and a half. And if you were going to make sawn frames for the same boat that we're building, you would want those frames to be at least five by five, which is a, a lot more material. Uh, it's a lot more weight. It's a lot more bulk. It takes up a lot more room in the boat. At the same time, you don't need to build all the molds and put the rib bands on that we did. <clears throat> so there's an advantage there. And same thing when we go to put the bulkheads in. So when we put our steam bent frames in, we twist them so that they match that twist of the boat. And when you go to put your bulkheads that go across the boat, it means that they hit a frame that hits them at a funny angle and they won't butt up perfectly. And with a grown or a sawn frame, they're perfectly amidship. So when you put your bulkheads on, they have this nice flat panel to meet to. But as a downside, when you do the sawn or grown frames, you need to cut that bevel into the outside of the frame, which we don't have to do with the bent frames. So you could probably argue all day long about which one is better and which one is worse, and they both have a ton of pros and a ton of cons. And it really depends on the exact size and the exact shape of the boat. If the boat is really crazy curvy, you just can't get the bent frames to bend that way. If the boat is really huge, you just can't bend frames that are that big. Um, so there are limiting factors in that area. But mostly it comes down to the designer's preference, the builder's preference, and in a lot of ways the construction material. If you're in an area that has a lot of live oak or some other oak like that that doesn't bend well but grows in huge sizes and crazy sweeps and curves, it just logically makes sense to build a boat with sawn frames. And if you live here in New England, where we have lots of beautiful straight-grained white oak, it makes sense to make boats with bent frames. Um, neither one is better or worse than the other. They're just different ways to reach the same goal. We hope this sheds a little bit of light on the differences between sawn frames and bent frames. Um, we've obviously showed the construction of a bent frame boat, and we haven't done the greatest job of showing you what a sawn frame actually looks like. If you want to see sawn frames done really, really well, a uh, great place to look is Leo um, over at Samson Boat Company, who's restoring Tally Ho on the West Coast. And Tally Ho was built with sawn frames, so Leo is restoring her with sawn frames, as you would. Um, and he goes through a great process of the futtixes and how all those are fastened together and the lofting process for those. And if you check him out, you can see just very different ways of building almost the same vessel in the end. And he's building his with live oak from down south because, as I mentioned, live oak grows in big, crazy sweeps and patterns. And if you look at our lumber pile versus his lumber pile, they are very, very different piles of wood. And that is because we're building very, very different framed boats.
So here we are top side and we've got a couple of our frames that we bent in. And if you look on a mold here, there's a gap in the back and the rib band is just touching on one edge of the mold. And the reason is that the molds are not beveled to the angle of the planking. And if you're doing sawn frames, you would have to put that bevel in. But with bent frames, the frame is contacting all the way along the rib band. And the reason is that is that we put that twist into the frame when we steam bend it in. And that's where the stone crusher comes in handy. So you can hook the stone crusher on the frame and you can push down and you can help to bend and really focus a specific spot of where you want to create that bend. And the other thing you can do with the stone crusher is you can twist and you can help put some of that twist in. Uh, so it's a very valuable tool for helping to manipulate these frames and getting them exactly where we wanted them. So this right here is a great example of why we split the frames. And you can see these were original, originally even before we bent it. And by bending it, this inner one came substantially taller than the outer one. And if we hadn't have split that frame, we would be asking this inner half to compress that and the outer half to elongate. And by splitting them, we're asking them to have to move a lot less. So we're putting a lot less torture onto these frames when we bend them in. And then after the planking goes on or as the planking goes on, it'll get through riveted. So you can imagine each of these frames will have a rivet approximately every six inches through the frame. So each frame will have at least 44 rivets going all the way through it. Um, so by the time it's all riveted together, that puppy is never coming apart. So we don't need to worry about glue or anything like that. There's not really any need. We had a bunch of astute observers in the previous video notice that there was no bedding compound or any fouling paint or any kind of rock preservative in the frame sockets uh, when you put the frames in. And that the frames are two pieces and a lot of folks are wondering if we were going to glue them together. And we're going to get into more of that in depth in the next video. But right now we're slowly going through the process of taking each frame out and giving them a really good look over, giving them a coat of oil, um, both inside the faces of the kerf and all the way around them, as well as painting the frame sockets, painting the ends of the frames. And when they go finally back in their homes, they will get bedding compound as well. Uh, if we had painted them and done any of that when we put the frames in with hot frames, it would have been a really big pain. And the other thing is the frames, they swell when you put them in the steam box. So we made all the sockets a slip fit. And once the frames were swelled, it was actually a driven fit. And now that they have dried, they're back to a slip fit. But by the time we put on a couple coats of paint and we put in the bedding compound, they'll be back to a driven fit and everything will be really nice and solid when we do the final assembly. So you can look forward to that in upcoding videos where we'll go through that process in a bit more in depth about taking the frames out and getting them ready for their final assembly. And again, thanks for watching and following our crazy journey. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ross. I'm an ASL interpreter who uh, motored up from DC. I, I was going to participate in a bicycle ride harbor to the bay. Uh, so after finishing that, I rode over here to check out this awesome project. I've been watching on YouTube for a while now. Um, and I'm a fellow DIYer, so I figured I'd lend a hand. Uh, they let me make this awesome cool tool called a stone crusher. And unfortunately, Steve broke the first two. Uh, but the third one really got those frames bent in beautifully. So it's been a great time out here, and I uh, really appreciate them letting me join the project. I'm Ryan Mall. I'm from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, second time I've been out here. Flew in just for the bending. And through the weekend, I managed the firebox and the steaming and just kept things running on time. Very excited to see how it comes together. I'm Wes. I'm from uh, Tennessee. Um, I'm a casual woodworker. I thought I'd come up and help out and do whatever I could to make this possible. Wes is being really, really understated. This is his second time here. We actually asked him to come up and uh, he was inside the boat bending all the frames with me and actually did more of the bending than I did. Um, so he deserves a lot more credit and excitement than he's giving. I'm assuming <laughs> it's just because he's really tired and a little hungover. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit. All right, Odie, you're on. Hi, my name's Odie Tucker and I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. First, I want to thank Amy for letting me come up and help 
Steve and Alex. I'm a maritime watercolor artist. It's great to be part of something bigger than myself. And I've been told I make pretty good fried chicken. <laughs> As an understatement. That's it. That's it. Cool. Perfect. <laughs> that was awesome. And a big thanks to Bob Pappas, who drove up from Pensacola, Florida, to help us out on the project as well.